we're at the beginning of the beginning, okay? For all of us that lived through the 2000, this was four years of sheer hell and a grind. Now we have $30 trillion that we have to work through the economy, a recession we have to overcome, a war we need to end, and people all of a sudden assume that two or three rate hikes and five or six months of headlines are enough. It's gonna take three years probably of the slow, meticulous, you know, running off of money, you know, not reintroducing new money. That may mean the bottom doesn't happen for another 18 months. So I think it's a, we're in, we're in for a lot of choppy um, market action. I don't understand why anybody would give up their liquidity in this moment right now. Why would you? Why would I, why would I give up $100 million of cash in my bank account? I would not do that right now. Jamath Palihapitiya believes that the pain we have seen across crypto markets and stock markets globally has only just begun and we have three more years of pain ahead of us. And he's not alone. Tied into the investing world such as Harvey Dent, Jamie Dimon and even the infamous Michael Burry also believe that the crash that will change a generation has only just got underway. Chamath Palihapitiya was once coined as the next Warren Buffett, making billions from being ahead of the crowd. Just recently, in November 2021, Shamath began unloading positions because he foresaw the pain that was about to come, a move that he got ridiculed for in the media. However, looking back, he timed the top of the market to almost perfection. In this video, Shamath via his recent podcast explains why lower lows are coming to markets and why investors should brace for a whole lot more volatility. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video where I will cover investment legend Michael Burry and why he agrees with Shamath's viewpoint. Also, only a small percentage of my viewers are actually subscribed. If you enjoy finance content, consider subscribing or liking the video. It's free and you can always change your mind. The thing that you have to do before you talk about what is happening now, I think it's probably useful to go back and you have to really start at the end of the great financial crisis. And the reason is there was a bunch of people coming out of the GFC who confused what the US government and some European governments were doing. At the time, there was the risk of a huge financial contagion. And so the US stepped in and the Federal Reserve started to use their balance sheet to buy toxic assets, right? And the ECB did that, and I think Japan did that as well. Anyways, a bunch of banks did it. I mean, a, bu a bunch of governments did it. And then there was this body of pseudoscientists, scientific economists who coined this thing called modern monetary theory, which basically said, hey, you can keep printing money and introducing it into the economy to smooth things out and to actually drive long-term growth. And it turns out that a bunch of government officials fell for it. And if you fast forward to 2022, so 14 years later, you know, governments around the world had printed something to the tune of about 30, 35 odd trillion dollars of money into the economy that should have never been there. So the thing to remember is like, we have not, necessarily just been obfuscating true supply demand in the last six or eight months when we've been talking about a recession or inflation. We've been actually doing it since 2008. It's just that it's been building up in the system. So one of the things that we have to realize is that all of that money somehow needs to get destroyed in some way, shape or form if the true economic equilibrium is meant to be found. What is true supply? What is true demand in the absence of government sloshing money around, trying to prop up things that should not be propped up or buying votes or all the grifts that these folks have engaged in in the last you know decade and a half have to get undone. So that's the backdrop. So if you think about taking $30 trillion out of the global economy, you know, you're talking about almost, you know, I think it's 85 trillion is the world GDP. So like, you know, it's, it's, it's almost half of an entire year's worth of global GDP. It's gonna take three years probably of the slow, meticulous, you know, running off of money, you know, not reintroducing new money. So it seems like we're at the beginning of the beginning of something that's gonna be long and drawn out. Now that's Sack separate from, and that's yeah. separate from whether we're in a recession or not. That's just the bear market that we're in, right? And so you have to look at asset prices today as a microcosm of a much larger trend that has to be about fake money pushing asset prices up 
and now taking all that fake money out and finding out what the real price of something is. And I just don't think that takes six months. So for all the people that were, you know, fingers crossed, hoping that this would be the end of it, Fed raises 75, we're done with this, they're gonna raise 75 more. I just think that's not how it's probably gonna be. It's gonna take, you know, 24, 36 months. That may mean the bottom doesn't happen for another 18 months. So I think it's a, we're in, we're in for a lot of choppy um, market action. I think we have to also be sensitive to the fact that the Fed operates on a certain class of data. And that data in the 21st century is pretty pathetic. Um, Nick, you can probably find this, but there was an article, I think it was in the New York Times, that really walked through how CPI is calculated. And it's a bunch of people that work for the government that walk around with iPads, building relationships with local businesses in all these random places all around the country and asking them to, you know, chit chat for 15 minutes and do these surveys. Now, you would have thought that in 2023 or 2022, what the government would have said to, you know, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, all the payment rails, the banks and Stripe is, send me a feed in the following structured way so that I can actually have an absolute precise sense of inflation because inflation really only occurs when a, a good or a service trades hands for money, right? And you calculate what did that thing trade at the day before and what does it trade for today? So you could get an absolute precise sense of it. Instead, we do this random sampling thing and Subjective, it's bad. So, humans, etc. So if you read this article, your takeaway will be, oh my God, this is very rickety and it drives an enormous hammer that we use to try to manage the economy. That's the first thing. I think you need to buckle your seatbelt because the next three, four, five months of CPI will probably be very, very bad. Seven, eight, nine percent. Why? There are a handful of components that have gotten completely run away. Number one, the biggest one is rent. And so rent works on a three month lag. We're gonna reintroduce what the true owner's equivalent rent is into CPI. So we can already forecast that CPI going up. Oil is at 105 bucks a barrel. Russia is basically trying to break the back of Europe by now messing with their nat gas supplies. Um, the German energy minister yesterday said that if that happens, it could be a contagion equivalent to Lehman Brothers with respect to energy. When you play all of these things out, what you have is unfortunately rampant runaway costs that really have no mechanism to get back in check in the absence of some real governmental changes, our policy on this Ukraine-Russia war, you know, how we intend to sort of uh, work or cooperate or fight with China, all of these things have to get s solved. So in the absence of that, prices are gonna continue to go up. And so what does the Fed do? How does it throw away what little credibility it has left when there's eight and 9% inflation prints and saying, we think we're done for right now. You can't do that. So they will overcorrect because there is just gonna be so much pressure for them to act. All roads, I think, lead to lower equity prices. And I think what David said astutely is, <coughs> we've seen the first wave, but now it has to touch all these other areas. For example, we have gotten totally drunk on debt as a country. One of the most obvious places where we've been serving alcohol far too late into the night is in the financing of all these private equity leverage buyouts. Yeah, right? Leverage these are, is dangerous. These are sketchy companies that are sort of like, you know, teetering on insolvency at times where private equity comes in, levers up the balance sheet with debt. They price it right to the edge of what's legally allowed or what's financeable, and then they go do it. But that's all assuming the economy continues to grow. And so if all of a sudden you have some recessionary forces or prices go up and earnings don't, you'll have you know a contagion in the debt markets. You could have a contagion in the commodity market. So we're dealing with some really um, real tough estate. boundary conditions. I mean, real estate. Mo mo most, most Americans have most of their net worth tied up in real estate. Yeah. And if we see a 30% 30, 30 correction in real estate, it could be a real problem, particularly with rising interest rates, inability to refinance. We're at the beginning of something that just fundamentally has to take some amount of time to work its way through the system. And so I don't understand why anybody would give up their liquidity in this moment right now. Why would you? Why would I, why would I give up $100 million of cash in my bank account? I would not do that right now.
So there's Shamath on why he thinks it's going to take at least another 24 to 36 months to flush all the excess printed money out of the economy and come to an equilibrium. And this wasn't a one-off thought for Shamath. In another podcast, he reiterated why he thinks there's a lot more pain coming from markets and why he's so bearish. Specifically, let's focus on NASDAQ and crypto, right? Tech stocks, biotech stocks, and, and crypto stocks go up much more aggressively. So what has Powell effectively done he has synthetically created a form of easing again, right? Like his job at the Federal Reserve, if you think about the money supply as a pipe, it's to shrink the pipe, to close off demand, to get things in equilibrium. So even though he's doing this, by the language that he's doing, he's effectively allowing market participants to basically guess that the worst is over and now we're gonna to start to expand the pipe again. And so they go to the end state. So what he effectively did in one speech is basically put a pin at the end of this year and is telling the markets, I'm mostly going to be done. And if anything, I'm probably going to be cutting in the back half of 23. Go on your merry way. And there is no CP So the problem with that, Jason, be, is yeah. it's now pushing the problem out another eight quarters. Like, we need to stop this nonsense. He needs to be definitive. And he needs to fundamentally break the back of inflation so that you find out what the true demand is in the economy. So, Jamath believing to properly break the back of this unprecedented inflation, the Federal Reserve will have to continue to raise rates over the course of multiple quarters, meaning this downward cycle will not be resolved for another two to three years. And he's not alone in his thinking. CEO of banking giant JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon also is warning investors to brace themselves for an economic hurricane as well as market guru Harry Dent blaming the Fed for the largest asset bubble in world history, predicting a 40% further drop and economic depression. However, the infamous investor Michael Burry, who also made a name for himself by being ahead of the crowd, so much so that Elon Musk called him a broken clock, also agrees with Chamath. It started in June of last year where Burry tweeted, people always ask me what is going on in the markets. It is simple. Greatest speculative bubble of all time in all things by two orders of magnitude. He went on to predict all hype slash speculation is doing is drawing in retail before the mother of all crashes. FOMO parabolas don't resolve sideways when crypto falls from trillions or meme stocks fall from tens of billions, Main Street losses will approach the size of countries. History ain't changed. And lo and behold, come 2022, it all came true. But what is Burry predicting now? Well, Burry recently tweeted, adjusted for inflation 2022, first half S&P down 25 to 26% and Nasdaq down 34 to 35%. Bitcoin down 64 to 65%. That was multiples compression, next up earnings compression, so maybe halfway there. So Burry agreeing with Chamath that we're only halfway through all this pain. Now personally, I wasn't in the school of thought that we were going to see a long drawn out recession, but after researching what Burry and Chamath think are going to happen, I'm starting to change my mind. If there's any two investors that I wouldn't want to bet against, it would probably be Burry and Chamath, but let me know what you guys are thinking in the comments. Hope today's video provided you guys with some value. If you did enjoy the video, consider subscribing or liking the video. As always, I'll see you in the next video and all the best.